Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our final keynote presentation. I am Maria Solares from HGSAC, and I will be your moderator today. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to remind you all that questions will be addressed at the end of our talk. You can send your questions via chat or raise your hand through reactions to speak up. We will also be recording this talk and it will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel later, so please keep an eye out for that. Today, we are honored to have Dr. Adele Terzio, who is sharing her professional insights in bringing our attention to a critical challenge within our scientific community in this day and age, how communication and interpretation of scientific results impact personal choices and public policy. Dr. Terzio earned her bachelor's in biological sciences and her PhD in physiology from Cornell University. After working a few years as a professor, she began her career in government at the Food and Drug Administration and then at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, also known as USDA, and National Institute of Food and Agriculture, also known as NEFA. At USDA and NEFA, she provided leadership, planning, and oversight for programs in animal health and production. She is currently the Vice President for Animal Agriculture Systems at World Wildlife Fund and the Head of Animal Science Department here at Penn State. With that, I am thrilled to welcome Dr. Terzio to this virtual state to now begin her presentation. Thank you for that kind invitation and thank you all for joining me for this um, introspective talk today. Um, I would like to precede this talk <clears throat> with, with a bit of a disclaimer, if you will. Um, I am not an expert in science communication nor am I an expert in personal choices or social science. I, um, as you just heard, I'm a physiologist by training and uh, my research career was, um, was focused on fundamental biological research. However, I think this is a really important topic and I was um, really pleased when the Life Sciences Advisory Committee came to me and asked me to speak on this because it is, a topic, it is a topic that I have been thinking about kind of in the periphery for a long, long time. And so this has given me an opportunity to really delve further into it. Um, so my objective today is not to um, influence your choices, um, whether they be personal or with respect to public policy, but it's simply to give you an idea of some of the things that are going on, some of the influences that um, are taking place in this space um, that we're calling science communication and, and science interpretation, and really just to get you thinking about it as well. And um, I hope that by the end of my talk that I have piqued your interest enough that you will find time in your busy schedule to go look into the literature and, and maybe um, think about this problem in more depth. Um, <clears throat> I hate to start any talk with a slide um, showing a picture of our former president on it, but I really couldn't get away from it because the term fake news um, in many ways, sadly, kind of sums a lot of things up. Uh, I dare say that 10 years ago, certainly 20 years ago, the term fake news hadn't even been heard of. And, and what does it mean? You know, what does fake news mean to you? Does it mean um, what we see on the right hand side of the screen here? Does it mean being bombarded every time you pick up your phone with information from Twitter, from Instagram, from <clears throat> the latest um, news released uh, from wherever you get your information. Uh, <clears throat> what does it mean? What does fake news mean? And how did we get here? So I think it's, um, I think it will behoove us <clears throat> to really set the, the stage for this talk to do a short history lesson first. Back in the dark ages, before many of you were even born, um, but when I was here on the planet, um, there was a time, believe it or not, before we had internet and before we had cable television. So this is back in the dark ages, right? But the important point is that the, the rise of the internet or the invention of the internet and the rise of cable television, which really started to gain traction in the 1990s or so, 
<clears throat> really change the way we communicate information. And <clears throat> before the internet and cable television were so prominent and so um, just a given in our everyday lives, authenticity was really difficult to spoof. We got our news primarily from three news um, channels, ABC, NBC, CBS. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of spin. There wasn't a lot of competition in the news or information communication arena. Um, and that's because the revenue model was really based on subscriptions. The old fashioned newspaper was based on circulation of that newspaper. And if you had a message that you wanted to get out, whether it be true or not, <clears throat> you needed to do it through one of these established vehicles, right? One of the, through these one of us, one of these established media outlets. So if you didn't have a newspaper, you didn't have a magazine, you didn't or couldn't get a spot in a magazine or a spot on a radio show or get on a TV show, it was really difficult for you to spread information, whether it be true or misinformation. And therefore, there was really little value to publishing a single catchy article. It was really based more on fact, if you will. Fast forward to today. And what we have seen over time is there have been massive shifts in communication technology, which I've already alluded to. It's not only the internet, but um, all kinds of ways that we get our information now by our phones, by our tablets, through our computers, over our radios. If any of you even listen to radio anymore, I still do. I listen to NPR. Um, but really this massive shift in communication technology that has happened in relatively recent history has also led to a dramatic shift in the economic structure and information has become monetized, okay? So instead of thorough, detailed and accurate reporting, which was what was the model or which was um, incentivized by, by the model of the old days, we now have information as, as it, you can make money simply by spreading information. And it doesn't matter if that information is true or evidence-based fact or fiction. People are, people are out. If it bleeds, it leads is a, is a famous line in journalism. So in some ways, this is harmless, right? It leads to clickbait, right? Okay, who doesn't love the little puppies on the right side? And the, the, um, you know, the, the clickbait for that is, oh, it's National Puppy Day. And then you may say, oh, National Puppy Day. That's interesting. And, you know, what does that mean, et cetera, et cetera. So in some ways, it's, it can be relatively innocuous, except that it's, it may waste your time when you should be working on writing a scientific paper or being in the lab. But that's beside the point. Um, but it also leads to some serious misinformation. And of course, the other thing that communication technology has done is it's taken communica communication and made it global. It's global and it's instantaneous. And so one of the most famous um, examples of misinformation that I came across in the mass media was from 2016, where a couple of Macedonian teenagers um, with no political agenda they just were, they just wanted to make some bucks. They came up with this completely fake story saying that Pope Francis was endorsing Donald Trump for president. Now we <laughs> know that that was not true. I think a lot of people really doubted it at the time, but those two teenagers made a heck of a lot of money just by putting this out into the communication space and then relying on the associated advertising to monetize that information. So Unfortunately, this is what has happened. So now that we have that part of our foundation, the other really foundational um, point that I'd like to get across from you today is that decisions and values are inextricably linked. Now, if you're like me and your knee-jerk reaction as a scientist is to say, oh no, my personal values are, have nothing to do with my science, science is objective, we're in pursuit of truth, I do my experiments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's not really true. We all have our values and we all have our prior beliefs. And it's just human nature that those values 
will impact our decisions. Um, they may be personal decisions, yeah, or they may be um, decisions with a broader impact. But in general, the way these decisions and, and values are linked is, again, it's just the way the human brain works. When you have information coming into your brain, your brain will quickly uh, process in, that information against the context of your values and your general beliefs using that as a guide. And then it's also human nature to tend to accumulate evidence that is either consistent with those prior beliefs and perhaps even reject or be skeptical of information that doesn't match um, those beliefs and those values. So over time, this um, so-called biased assimilation of information can really um, have important impacts on a lot of different things. Policy, um, politics, those things are not really the topic of my talk today. Don't worry, I'm gonna get back to the science. But, but again, this is important foundational information because I think that there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from the mass media and how information is communicated outside of science and how that impacts um, what's happening in science communication today. This biased assimilation then can lead to beliefs that um, are strongly held for, for good reasons and per, for bad reasons. And um, it can even lead to some groups really diverging away from the consensus because they are assimilating information in this way. So of course we rely on communication of readily available information to make decisions. So I don't wanna paint the internet as a bad thing. The internet is a fantastic thing. It has opened up communication. Um, hospitals can communicate with each other across the world. We have access to so many more journals now than we used to in the old days where you had to go to the library and sift through paper copies of journals, right? And we need that information. That information is really benefiting us. Um, but what we have to be careful of is sorting out the true information from the untrue information or the questionable information. The other important um, foundational piece that I'd like to to establish here early in the talk is that misinformation, and we're going to talk about different types of misinformation, but misinformation undermines good decision making. Could be decisions, your personal choices. Um, should I buy this shampoo, shampoo A or shampoo B? Should I get vaccinated against COVID-19 or not? Um, all kinds of personal choices. Should I buy a Toyota or should I buy a Honda? Um, you rely on good unbiased information to make those personal choices. But I'd like you to think also about it in a, in a broader sense. Um, there are many, many important decisions that have to be made every day, every minute about problems that are affecting local issues, regional issues, and global problems. So when we think about public health, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic gives us such a great um, case study, if you will. And I believe that we'll be learning from this public health emergency for decades to come about the decisions that were made. Were they based on good data? Were they based in some cases on misinformation? We have a lot to learn still. Um, global challenges such as climate change, which is one that I am very passionate about. Problems um, of social inequity and even international peace. When you think about how much, um, for example, our armed forces rely on massive amounts of data to inform their decisions. Um, information and the quality of that information is so very critical. And then it follows, of course, that decisions based on misinformation and science could also have dire consequences. And um, healthcare is probably the best example in science of how a bad decision could really um, harm a lot of people. So is there a misinformation problem in science? Again, your knee-jerk reaction might be, no, science is objective. You know, we create, we design experiments, we generate data, we analyze the data, there are the answers. No, I, no misinformation. Well, yeah, there is a misinformation problem in science. And it turns out to be bigger than I thought it was, um, again, based on my recent reading. 
So why? Why is there this misinformation problem in science? Well, here I think is where the parallel between the mass media and the way we get our non-scientific information really parallels a lot of the things that are happening in the scientific literature and in the scientific community right now. And one way is the way that we publish and read scientific information. So I already mentioned this. When I was in graduate school um, and while I was writing my thesis, I went to the library every day. And the library, yes, I loved the library. And you would go through the stacks and you would pick out um, paper copies of journals and you would read those copies, um, those articles. And if you wanted to take that and highlight it and annotate it, you photocopied it. I'm sure you've heard these stories from your mentors over and over again. Those, again, were the, were the old days. Now it's all electronic. We read everything online. We don't carry paper around at all. So that's a, that's a good thing. But the way we publish, this has had, I think, big impacts on how we publish information. There's tremendous pressure to publish, and there's always been pressure, particularly in the academic world, to publish your work. But there seems to be an increasing pressure to publish with an over-reliance on quantity versus quality. So what do I mean by that? Um, you've since this is an academic talk, we can talk about the tenure and promotion process. And you know, to get tenure in an academic institution, in most fields, certainly in scientific fields, you need to publish papers, you need to publish the evidence of your work. Um, and in many fields, the emphasis is not necessarily on the quality of your publications, but the number of your publications. Oh, so and so published 10 papers, and the other person only published five. So the person who published 10 papers must be more productive, right? And must be having a greater impact on science. Mm, not necessarily. I would, I would argue, I would like to argue with that and think and encourage you to dig deeper. Um, there's a lot of salami slicing that goes on. Salami slicing means instead of designing a, a set of experiments, doing that entire set of experiments based on a biological question, and then publishing the results all as one big complete paper, you might say, oh, I can, you know, maybe go to a lesser, a less rigorous journal and publish just a little bit of my data and then publish the next little bit and the next little bit so that I can get up to those 10 publications instead of five and therefore, you know, gain more prestige, gain tenure, gain whatever it is that you're after. So this pressure, pressure, pressure on publication has really changed the way we publish our work. There are also a lot of inaccurate and exaggerated titles and claims. Um, for example, one study that I reviewed showed that if you, in the obes obesity and nutrition literature, that over one third of the titles of the papers were really misleading and they didn't really, uh, did not accurately represent the information that was, that was published in that paper. So again, another parallel with mass media, we go for the splashy headline, we go for the eye grabbing um, title or information or headline rather than really being true and accurate to the science and what's in that paper. Another thing that um, is relatively new on the scientific scene is this concept of preprint servers. So bioarchive is one, and I don't mean to pick on bioarchive um, in this, but I, I just put it on the slide as just an example. So these preprint servers serve a, a really neat um, function within the scientific community because it allows people to communicate with each other, again, globally across the world. Um, they can, you can submit um, non-peer review information, and that's the key. This inf the information in these preprint servers has not been peer reviewed, but yet it's out there. And it's out there for comment, it's out there for, for good purposes. But what can happen is because it is publicly available, oftentimes journalists will get a hold of it. They either don't understand the science or they don't understand the fact they don't understand the importance of peer review and they'll grab headlines or they'll just grab snippets of information out of these preprint servers, interpret it inappropriately and then communicate it. And, and this can have um, really bad implications. One example of this that we saw just last year 
was um, early in the year, you will remember that there was some speculation about the origins of the COVID-19 and whether or not it was a bioweapon that had originated from China. And that speculation can be traced back to unpeer-reviewed information that was submitted to uh, BioArchive that was later retracted, I believe, but it didn't matter because by that point, the, some journalists had gotten a hold of it, it had been communicated and um, even led to further communication by the President of the United States. So that's just one example of how information in these non-peer-reviewed publicly available databases um, can be beneficial, but they can also have really uh, negative implications as well. So let's talk about some of the types of misinformation or types, yeah, types of misinformation in science. So one is publication bias. So as we all know, typically positive results are much easier to publish than negative results. So by negative results, I mean, you design an experiment, let's say you have a, you're testing a new drug, since we're talking about drugs on this slide, you're testing um, a new drug, you expect a certain result, you test two groups of, an test the drug in two groups of animals, um, and at the end of the experiment, there's no difference. Those, that's what I mean by negative results. A positive result would mean that you have some response in, um, to the drug in one group, in the treated group versus the, the, the negative control group. Well, and this has not changed over the years, but um, journals don't like to publish negative results. It's not exciting, right? It's not splashy. It's not, um, it's not a change. They don't see it as an addition to the body of knowledge in, in any one specific discipline. So journals have historically favored positive, publication of positive results over negative results. And this can lead to bias in and of itself, right? Because I often wonder, I have generated my share of negative results, believe me, and I never publish them. And I, then sometimes I've wondered, well, who else in the world who's interested in the same things that I am, are they out there doing the same experiment, thinking that they're going to get positive results when I've already shown that there's no, no effect or there's no difference? So it, it's not an efficient way to do science, right? If, if I knew that somebody in Germany had already done an experiment, gotten negative results, why would I, I might redo it in my, in my laboratory, slightly different conditions, but again, negative, the, the, the message I'm trying to get across here is negative results do have value, but they don't get published. And that leads to publication bias. One um, example that I found um, illustrates this, and I think it's it's pretty um, shocking, actually. So, <clears throat> and I used to work for the FDA, as um, you learned in my bio. So, to get a drug approved by the FDA, pharmaceutical companies need to submit a um, results of a battery of tests, really, really extensive tests, and then reviewers at the FDA, like I was a reviewer, are charged with looking at the results of those. Um, studies and determining if the drug is safe for either the animal or the human um, that it is intended for. Does it have toxic effects? Does it have effects on the environment? And um, in my world, I was working on new drugs for food animals. Um, and in that case, we asked the question, does the drug leave any residues in the edible tissues of the animal? that could pose a risk to human health. So it's all about risk, um, risk assessment. And um, in one study, they, um, some authors reviewed uh, a series of clinical trials that had, done, that had been done to support um, approval by the FDA of a, a new class of antidepressant drugs. And when they looked at the results of these clinical trials in the published literature, in the peer-reviewed published literature, they found that 94% of those studies showed positive results. But when they did a FOIA, which is a, a public request for information um, to the FDA to look at the original data that was submitted and reviewed by the FDA, they found that, I, that only 51% of, of the studies showed positive results. 
So this difference doesn't mean that the drug is necessarily unsafe. It just shows that of all of the studies that were done by these companies to determine um, target animal efficacy and target animal safety, the animal being human in this case, the developers of the drug chose to selectively publish only the results that showed positive, that were positive. And they didn't publish the negative ones. Doesn't mean the FDA didn't do its job. It doesn't mean that um, those results, the studies that showed negative results were insignificant. They were significant. They were considered by the FDA in the whole, the whole um, basket, if you will, of results that were submitted. The FDA did make a determination based on the entirety of those results. But the companies and the information that they published only published or perhaps were only able to publish because of publication bias on the basis of the journals, they were only able to publish the positive results. So that's just one example that indicates um, the phenomenon of publication bias. Another one is that I'm really um, passionate about is citation bias. By this, I mean erroneous use of citations to justify claims. And I hope that all of the students viewing this talk today have have found multiple instances of citation bias. If you've never found uh, an instance of citation bias, you're not looking closely enough and you need to look more closely. Just because something is published in the literature does not mean that it is factually correct. Um, so this is the, the frequency of citation bias is a little bit difficult to, to ascertain with, um, with certainty. But in one study, it was estimated to be between 10, I'm sorry, there's a percent message, uh, percentage sign missing there, estimated to be between 10% and 20% of citations across all um, scientific publications. What's the intent behind this? So in other words, if I say, um, you know, if I write a paper and I make a claim that um, oak trees grow, um, one foot per year, and then I put a citation down. And the actual citation that I say, that I use, doesn't say they grow a foot a year, it says they grow six inches a year. That's, that's the citation bias that I'm talking about. So what was my intent there? And an intent, of course, is impossible to measure. Was I, was I, by doing that, was I intentionally trying to mislead the reader? Was I intentionally trying to support the claim that I'm trying to make or to support my data that show that oak trees um, grow a foot a year? Or was I just too lazy to go and read the paper that I'm using as a citation to really determine with certainty that, that the information in that paper is supporting what I'm trying to say? It's hard to say, but there is definitely evidence, and I hope you will agree with me that 20% um, of, of um, erroneous citations is way too high, and 10% is disturbing enough. There's a great example here. Um, there's a, apparently a fairly famous five-sentence letter that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that was um, based on a study that was done in a hospital setting giving people opioids to relieve severe pain. And based in that hospital setting, relatively small number of patients in a very controlled setting, these authors published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is a very, very highly respected and prestigious journal, that there was um, very little risk of addiction um, using narcotics to, to relieve pain in patients. That letter has been used time and time and time again by other authors to say that opioids are not addictive when we know that that is absolutely not true. And what's the difference here? The difference is because um, that study was done in a very controlled hospital setting and it was not done in homes by people who are not hospitalized. That's where the risk of opioid addiction is much, much higher than it is in a hospital setting. But yet only 20% of papers, one out of five that use this citation, um, recognize this limitation and this important difference between the studies. So 
there's one example of citation bias. Data distortion. Um, so I've broken this one down into two parts. Uh, the first is statistical analysis. So not every experiment needs to be analyzed statistically. When it does need to be analyzed statistically, um, there are appropriate and inappropriate statistical methods. And what I was always taught, and what I hope that you have also been taught, is the time to figure out which statistical analysis method you're going to use is not after you've done the experiment, right? You need to, the statistical analysis methods need to be an integral part of experimental design. In other words, you need to design your experiment with the statistical um, analysis in mind so that when you get to the end, you have your data all generated, then you can plug them into the statistical model that you already have waiting and analyze your results. When, when that's not done, when that series of events is not um, done in order, you do the experiment first and worry about how you're going to analyze it statistically later, it makes it a whole lot more difficult to determine whether the differences that you are seeing or the trends that you're seeing in your data are significant or are they simply trends or random effects. Um, <clears throat> so this, this can really lead to misleading findings and conclusions. I pose a question, who should learn statistics and analyze data? Uh, so personal, personal example, um, my research was on reproductive physiology in cattle. I was interested in hormone levels, uh, dynamic hormone levels and how changes in blood hormone levels affect what's happening at the level of the ovary. And so to determine this, I needed to take many blood samples from cattle and I needed uh, from my experimental subjects and I needed to take them around the clock because these levels of hormones were not constant, but they were changing over time. And so to get a really clear and accurate picture of these patterns of hormone secretion, I needed to take repeated blood samples from individual animals. And I did this for multiple animals. I had a control group and I had a treated group. And so to analyze that information, I couldn't just do a simple t-test and put all of the, all of the blood values, you know, calculate a big mean, compare treated to control, and then, and then make my comparison. That would have been completely inappropriate statistical analysis because every time I took a blood sample from an animal, the blood level in that sample would be related to the sample that I had taken a few hours before because it's a living animal and it's a dynamic system and things change over time. It can be circadian rhythms, diurnal rhythms, um, changes in stress levels. I mean, there's all kinds of things, but the fact is this called for a specific type of statistical analysis called repeated measures analysis. It was more complicated, but I learned how to do it. And I had confidence in my data at the end that I was analyzing it correctly. It was painful. It was a painful process, but I lived through it. <laughs> um, and so then fast forward later into my career where I served as a peer reviewer for journal articles. And I was asked to review studies that had been done um, using a similar, similar experimental design, asking similar biological questions. And many, many times I would find in reviewing the paper that people were not doing their statistics appropriately. They weren't taking that repeated measures into account. And, and that really just changes um, the results of your data and, and changes the conclusions. And so the question that I pose here is who should learn statistics and analyze the data? Should graduate students learn statistics and learn how to analyze their data? Or should they just say, oh, no, I'm going to focus on the science. I'll just send my data off, ship my data off to the statistics department or some statistician, which happens in a lot of companies, by the way, and let them analyze the data. I think that causes a really big divide because statisticians are not biological scientists and they don't always understand the biological question that is being asked 
or the environment and types of animals or, or humans in which it's being asked. So I think that statistics um, really needs to be part and parcel of experimental design because the implications are just too great in the way that you interpret your data and then how you communicate those interpretations. Another one is how you present and visualize your data. So you can, um, again, going back to my example, I could have calculated means um, and maybe shown my blood values, the blood values you know, as a bar graph, but that really wouldn't have told the whole story because again, these are living animals, these are constantly changing blood levels. And so the best way to show that type of data is with a line graph so that you can see trends, so that you can see changes over time. Um, and so, you know, all types of data are very different. And now we have big data, right? How do you, how in the world, that's not gonna fit in a bar graph. So how do we present big data? How do we analyze and present huge, um, huge amounts of data in a way that can be understood not only by scientists, but also by uh, policymakers um, and the public. I also encountered that there is um, a problem of numerical literacy in the general population. And unfortunately, based on, well, I'll say, unfortunately, I think this may extend into the scientific community as well. Um, people don't understand numbers and we as scientists may underestimate that because we in general do, under, do understand numbers, or at least I do. And I did, I had to, to do my research. But what if you're just not a numbers person? So if we say that there's a risk of a disease and um, you know, your probability of getting that disease um, may be 20% uh, greater if, you're in, if you have a pre-existing condition. Well, to the average person in the general U.S. population, they have trouble understanding what that means, this increased probability. But yet we hear that term all the time. Um, and so we, I think we need to take that into account when we're communicating our science, that not everyone is numerical literate, not everyone is a scientist, and not everyone um, can, can understand and grasp information in the same way. Sometimes it will need to be through writing, sometimes a simple pie chart is the way to go. Other times you can get more elaborate um, and show it in different ways. So enough on data distortion. Another phenomenon um, is filter bubbles and echo chambers. So what does this mean? This is really kind of jargonistic to um, identify this phenomenon, which is the existence of algorithms so we're talking the internet now, there are algorithms that learn through machine learning how to select and show you content based on your previous views, right? So how many times have you been, um, say, let's take this past weekend, right? I was shopping for new shoes, new, new shoes. So I was shopping for shoes, doing my Google searches, doing my comparative comparison shopping, which I do, and I bought a pair of shoes. Okay, fine. And then I log on Monday morning to maybe do a lit search or look something up for work. And what's coming up on the side of the, on the, side of the screen? It's shoes, right? Um, because it, it, these algorithms learn um, what you're looking for, and then they want to keep showing you that same thing. So does this happen in science? Um, how do we get our scientific information now? A lot of people use Google Scholar. That's very commonly used. Um, there are other ways, how, many, how often, I will admit that even for this talk, when I was trying to find information on certain things, I would just Google something, you know, filter bubble science, click, and then it brings information up. But how can we really be sure that we are getting unbiased, accurate information. How can we be sure that we are getting the information that, that we want to see and need to see and not information that Google thinks we want to see? So, and another related question is, um, now we have access to so much information. We don't have to go to the library and trudge through the stacks and, and read paper copies. 
at the click of a button, we can we can access so many different journals, and many of them are publicly available and and free um, now. So now that we have so much information, are are scientists in general reading more broadly, or are they reading more narrowly? Perhaps because of these algorithms, these filter bubbles, their so-called echo chambers. One thing I discovered, I don't have an answer to that question. It's a, just a thought question for you. But one thing I discovered that I never thought of is that um, Google Scholar returns articles in an order that is influenced by the number of previous citation accounts. So the more someone reads a particular article, the more often Google Scholar is going to bring that article up when someone else types in the same search. So that goes back to supporting citation bias and, and uh, all kinds of biases. So just something, again, to think about. I'm not throwing Google Scholar under the bus. I'm just um, making you aware and getting you, trying to get you to think about how we're getting our information and why we're getting the information we are getting. Um, a new term for you, maybe it's not new for you, but it was new for me, agnotology. Agnotology. This is creation of doubt around scientific findings and can even go a step further um, into manipulating what we know and do not know about scientists. So this is kind of getting into the nefarious side, but uh, I, I wanted to make you aware of this and get you thinking about this as well. I said earlier that intent is difficult to measure. Um, even in the best of times, it's difficult to, to prove or disprove what someone meant by doing something. But some examples I think can, can illustrate this. So believe it or not, there was a debate, again, probably before most of you were born, or maybe after you were born, I don't know. I don't know exactly when this debate was, but believe it or not, there was a longstanding debate about the um, relationship between smoking tobacco and cancer and whether or not smoking cigarettes was related or caused lung cancer. It was debated for a very long time. And one reason that that debate stayed alive as long as it did is because the tobacco companies um, and believe it or not, the tobacco companies employed scientists to make this claim that there was so there was still doubt that the the scientific consensus had not proven beyond um, a question of doubt that cigarette smoking caused lung cancer. There was still some uncertainty there, and and the tobacco companies wanted. This, the, the public regulators to hang on to that doubt and say, well, we don't know for sure. So perhaps we shouldn't come down really hard with final regulations on tobacco. Luckily, um, science, the consensus of the science won out and we do have um, uh, some better regulations and at least warnings on cigarette packages um, about that. Same thing has happened with climate change. And this is something that I unfortunately uh, witnessed when I was working at the US Department of Agriculture. Um, even though the vast majority of science, available science indicates um, what's happening with climate change, not that we understand everything, but that there is anthropomorphic, uh, there are anthropomorphic reasons behind uh, our changing climate. Um, what I saw in the federal government, unfortunately, is that political uh, agenda can change the emphasis from the, change the emphasis of focusing on the consensus, the scientific consensus to the scientific minority and always keeping that doubt alive. Oh, but we don't know for sure. And you know, this is not proven. This is only based on, on speculation. And this study, the p-value was only 0.04 or something like that. Um, so that could be a whole nother talk about how politics can, can influence public policy. Um, and then of course there are, there are examples in COVID-19 too. So yes, this can delay or inhibit regulatory action. 
There's a principle that um, we in the US government do not use, but is followed quite often by the European communities, for example, and that's the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle says that if there is any risk at all for, for, for some questions in terms of risk, particularly to human health, that the risk must be zero. And if science cannot prove that the risk due to cigarette smoking or driving a car or whatever it is, if the risk cannot be proven to be zero, then they will regulate against it. Uh, when I worked for the FDA, I saw the precautionary principle and its impact um, up, live and up close and personal. I was the subject matter expert for the FDA and for the US government um, with respect to a uh, trade dispute between the United States and the European communities over the safety of beef produced in the United States. In the interest of time, I won't go into the technical details, um, but, um, but the European communities insisted that using the precautionary principle because the US could not demonstrate zero risk from consuming beef based on hormone residues in the beef that they were not going to import it. And this resulted in a major trade dispute, international trade dispute that was litigated at the World Trade Organization um, over a period of four years. So it's just an example of how different concepts of risk and, and different ways that science can be interpreted um, can really have major global implications. The falsehood fire hose. So this is another uh, form of agnotology, if you will, where um, you don't necessarily focus on the small remaining uncertainty, but you, but you purposely obfuscate the, the issue by just flooding the information space with, inf with information. Some on one side of the issue, some on the other side, some confounding issue, just flood the whole, just, just flood everybody so that nobody knows what the heck is going on. And it makes it very difficult to separate truth from misinformation. Um, this was another thing that, uh, another tactic that the European communities used in the trade dispute that I just described. Um, one way that they did this is they would submit not to the scientists, but they would submit to the attorneys at the US Trade Representative's office, packets of information varying from 100 pages at a time to maybe 500 pages at a time of what they called scientific evidence. Scientific evidence proving that the risk that they alleged was significant and, and, and um, justified their trade ban. So it was my job to go through that scientific evidence to really see what was there. And what I found is there was very little evidence in the scientific information that they provided, which, which varied from scientific publications to raw data to articles from the popular press. I mean, it was, it was a wide variety of information, but there was very little information there to support their case from a scientific perspective. But what they were doing is they thought, okay, these attorneys aren't gonna understand this information. So we're just gonna send them 500 pages of scientific information. They're not gonna know what to do with it. They're not gonna know how to interpret it. And so therefore they'll just have to cave and they won't be able to defend their, their scientific basis for their argument. Um, so an example of falsehood fire hose. Okay. So I hope that I haven't um, depressed you too much over this lunch hour talk. And I don't want you, I don't want to leave you with a very bleak picture of misinformation in science and, and how, um, how it may be impacting really important choices, because I think there are ways forward. And I think that um, good decisions are being made at many levels. And I think it just, um, I think there are new things perhaps that can be considered to fight this, um, to fight this information, misinformation. And I've tried to summarize them in this table. 
So we talked on talked a bit about uh, about over reliance on publications as a productivity metric. Publish to get tenure, publish to get promoted in a company. You know, publish, publish, publish. Some possible solutions to this um, are to take a hard look at the promotion incentives and perhaps revise them to encourage the the behavior that we want to see and to discourage the behavior that leads to the salami slicing and the going for the splashy titles and headlines rather than really doing good science that has really solid integrity. And one way to do this is to value the quality of publications more than the quality. What value the quality more than the quantity. Um, would you rather have one or two publications? Would you rather have one, pub, one publication in science? Or would you rather have 10 publications on some online journal that has really sketchy peer review methods. Quality versus quantity. What about publication bias? This is an interesting one. Um, the concept of registered reports has been um, suggested. And this is where a journal doesn't review your paper, it actually reviews your experiment before it's even done. And it agrees to either accept or reject the results of that experiment whether they're positive or negative. So this is a way to get away from that bias towards only publishing positive data and also publishing negative data, which in and of itself can also be informative and important. Citation bias, this is a, this is a tough one. And really the, the way to stop this, at, stop this at its, um, at its roots, if you will, is to do an in-depth review of citations before papers are published, but that is very labor intensive. Um, and the peer review um, enterprise, if you will, is already overtaxed. And so I don't really see this one going forward, at least not across the board, um, but it is a, it is a huge problem. Um, and we need to find some way of, of addressing that one. Data distortion. Um, this was the statistical analysis and the way that you present your data. Here, I think it really falls on educating the next generation of scientists um, and increasing the emphasis on both statistical literacy and numerical literacy. And one could argue that this needs to go back even further into public schools and ensure that um, students understand to, to ensure that girls are not scared away from math and told that they can't do math, which we know is not true. Um, and, and to just put an increased emphasis on people being able to understand numbers, understand when they read something like you have a zero, you know, X percent increased risk. What does that really mean for your personal choices? And then more broadly for public policy decisions. And then the filter bubbles, echo chambers, um, just be aware that not all search engines are created equal. Um, beware of their shortcomings and, and consider some alternatives. I wanna leave time for questions. So I'm going to quickly go over my take home messages. One is that decisions and values, even in science, they are inextricably linked decisions and values, whether we talk about you, um, your personal values or your scientific values, what do you value in science? And that may be a, a, an interesting question for you to ponder um, when you're sitting outside in the sun later this afternoon, taking a break. What are your personal values and what are your scientific values? And how are they, how do they impact your decisions? Two is that there are important parallels and I think lessons that can be learned um, from what has happened to our mass media and what is going on in science communication today. Three, misinformation, this, this is an obvious one. When we are misinformed, it really prevents us from making good sound decisions. Misinformation does exist in science and it has very important implications and will continue to do so. And lastly, scientists like ourselves, should be aware of this misinformation problem and do what we can to support efforts to minimize its impacts. That is my last slide. I will be very happy to take any questions or comments. And I see that Isabel has asked for you to put them in the chat. So I will be watching the chat.
Yes, thank, thank you. you so much, Dr. Terzier, for that excellent talk. We'll give a few seconds for people to start submitting their questions. I know it takes a hot second to get them through. So Dr. Tazio, um, while some people will start thinking about their questions, I'm just curious, uh, what was the end of that um, trade dispute that you mentioned? How was the Yes, that's always the question that I get. And, and I always want to say, yes, the US won. Um, but it's more complicated than that. And I, I think the short answer to that is neither side won, and it, but the, um, the decision of the World Trade Organization body was not based on science. It was based on a technical error that was made by attorneys on both sides, unfortunately. So in common language, you can kind of say that the, the case was thrown out of court, but, but it was followed up with using another common term, kind of a plea bargain. So the two sides, instead of, instead of starting back at square one and doing the whole four-year process over again, they kind of reached an agreement um, out of court. Um, but it's clear in my mind that, that scientifically our side was much, much stronger. Yes, so Rakaya Kaya is asking um, if there's a reference to go in depth and I can certainly send those. Um, I will send those to the organizers and then they can be, I don't have them, um, I don't put them in my presentation because I ran out of time, um, but I can send those to you. Thank you, that would be amazing. I do have a question of my own. Um, I know the scientific field has been pushing away or trying to push away from anonymous peer review to actually putting names on reviewers. Do you think that would increase or decrease the bias in your own personal opinion? I think it would, I think it depends on the reviewers. And I think if you were to go to that system that the ground rules would have to be set up front. Um, and you would really need to look for reviewers who were doing it completely. I mean, it's a service, right? Reviewing papers, reviewing grant proposals, all of that. That is a service that we provide to our scientific community. And for someone to do that, they really need to do it from an altruistic perspective, not from a, a personal, um, not as a way to get ahead themselves. So, I don't know. I, I would have to think about that one, but I think it really it really depends on the ground rules and the reviewers, and and them having some um, some skin in the game and some repercussions if if people didn't follow the rules, whatever they were. Question in the chat from Alana is: How do you deal um, mistrust with misinformation that can interfere with policy, even if it's proven wrong? Politicians may be hesitant to adopt a policy that had previous misinformation if the public is worried. Yeah. I'm trying to think of a specific, it sounds like you have a specific example in mind, Alana, and I'm not guessing right now. I'm not coming up with an example. Um, that, I don't, I don't yeah. know if I have a specific example in mind, but just like I know a lot of times, um, people can be worried, like at least in animal agriculture, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And so even if scientists work super hard to, to show that, like, I guess, for example, like genetically modified organisms won't, just like to give a broad topic, like GMOs aren't harmful to human health, but if the public, if there's a lot of misinformation and the public still mistrusts, politicians might not wanna get on the public's bad side if they wanna be reelected. And so they'll still go with the misinformation. Yes, yes, that definitely happens. And there's also a phenomenon um, where it doesn't really matter how much science you show the public, you're still not gonna change. If, if it's an emotional topic, if it's a topic that, that causes an emotional change in them, it doesn't matter how much science you show them, it's not gonna change their mind. At the FDA, we used to call this, call this the yuck factor, and it does not matter, may not matter how much information we can generate showing that genetically modified foods are safe or cloned animals are safe for consumption, et cetera, et cetera. When it comes to something that people are eating, that takes it to a whole different level where values and emotion 
are inextricably linked. And it makes it just that much more difficult to reach a, a good solid policy decision that will be accepted by the public. So it's a good question. Very good, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Terzio. We've ran out of time for questions, but we wanna thank you again for joining us today and giving us such a wonderful presentation. I think I can speak for everyone present and say it was incredibly enlightening. Mm -hmm.